Okay, hello and welcome to uh, the first webcast in our Fall BI and Reporting Series. I am Jason Gumpert from msdynamicsworld.com and I'm really happy to have uh, everyone here with us today for the event. Uh, I'm particularly excited to be joined by Stacia Meisner, a true BI and Reporting expert who will be talking to you today. And uh, Stacia is uh, a SQL Server MVP. She's an author, a consultant, an educator, and we are really pleased to have her with us. Uh, we invite you to add your feedback and ask questions today throughout uh, Stacia's presentation. And there are, are a couple ways you can do this. First, you can use the Q&A tab that you'll see uh, in the webcast session here. And second, uh, feel free to, to tweet your thoughts and questions. We'll be using the hashtag MSDWBI to, uh, to watch for. Um, we'll be sure to leave some time at the end for you to ask your questions as well. So. Um, Without further delay, please allow me to welcome Stacia Meisner. And Stacia, one minute while I make sure that you're on, not on mute. Okay, Stacia, go ahead. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Taking Business Intelligence to the Next Level, Collaborative BI. And my name is Stacia Meisner. You can follow my writing about business intelligence at my blog site, blog.datainspirations.com. And I invite you to follow me on Twitter, too, where my handle matches my name to keep it easy to find me. So today we are going to talk about uh, some technology with BI and collaborative uh, technologies. Technology has been helping us to do our jobs better for a few decades now, and yet there always seems to be more that has to be done. And I've been involved exclusively in the business intelligence space now for almost 14 years, and we'll start our discussion today with my observations of the changes and the expectations and the capabilities in BI and where collaboration fits into this. And then I'll introduce you to the steps involved in the collaborative decision-making process, and I'll put those steps into context by showing you how this process might work within the Microsoft Business Intelligence stack. And then I'll spend some time exploring some ways that you can create a more collaborative BI environment yourself. But first, let's get started with a general overview of where we've been and where we're going with BI in general, and in particular by adding in collaborative capabilities. Now, business intelligence is supposed to solve data access problems for us. And in particular, self-service BI was the big buzzword a couple of years ago. But I remember when I started in BI many years ago that self-service was the holy grail that we were all searching for. And I was one of those IT people that was looking for a solution to the problem of getting the right information to the right people at the right time. And lo and behold, I discovered business intelligence. And I remember well the self-service aspects that were the promise of BI at that time, such as you can see here in this quote from the Data Warehouse Institute in a journal article that same year, uh, 1999. So what they said was, with a single entry point, decision makers quickly find, organize, automate, deliver, and aggregate all forms of information supporting the decision process without IT assistance. And that sure sounds like self-service BI to me. So like many other IT professionals, I started building BI solutions. So let's take a look at a typical diagram that shows the formal structures that are part of a traditional BI environment. We, of course, have our data sources on the left, whether they're relational sources or flat files or legacy system data. And these are all the data sources that are capturing information about the business. And often there are many different types of data sources, often in different formats. And these data sources are useful to users who have lots of questions, but for a variety of reasons, the data sources aren't useful in their original form because the data is still raw. And asking questions of data requires summarization and filtering and applying calculations and various activities that adversely impact our operational systems. So we move the data into a separate storage area, such as a data warehouse or a data mart or something that's similar. It's part of a BI solution. And to get the data into that new storage, we use Extract, Transform, and Load, or ETL tools, which allow us to clean up, reformat, and integrate the data. And now this restructured data 
data is usually a dimensional model in the form of dimensions and fact tables. And we might even create multidimensional databases called cubes. Now with cubes, we can automatically aggregate the data and then get faster query results. Without cubes, we can accomplish similar results by adding summary tables to the data warehouse, but this requires even more processes to make sure that the summary and the detail tables stay in sync. But regardless of the technical details behind this consolidation, the point is that we've created a separate source that's structured in a way that's easier to query and has faster query response times, and importantly, is separate from the operational systems so that the read operations of the BI queries do not interfere with the write operations of the business transactions. And from the restructured data, we develop reports and dashboards and scorecards, and all kinds of information can flow out of this environment. Now in this scenario, ideally our users are able to build their own reports. We can get a lot of benefits from this environment. The whole point of separating data from the source is to avoid impacting the operations of the business while we're running those analytical queries that typically require summarization of large quantities of data. But the big problem with this approach is that it takes a lot of time and effort to build out this infrastructure. Now for certain types of information, that time and effort is well worth it. We need an official source of consolidated, cleansed, and certified information for reporting up and out, up to corporate management and out to external stakeholders. But unfortunately, traditional BI is not always self-service BI. I saw one survey once that said only 8.2% of the employees of a typical organization regularly use BI applications, and another one puts the number higher at 15 to 20%. Now, in my consulting practice, I find that percentage trends towards the lower end. So what's happening? Well, in many companies, users are still relying on standard reports that have limited interactivity. And reports might have parameters that allow users to filter the reports, or they may allow the users to drill down into more detail. But typically, these reports are built to answer one question, and not necessarily the next question that the user might have. And so, when these new questions arise, users wind up going back to IT to get those reports. And another problem that we have with traditional BI is that the data warehouse is often designed with what I call the left-to-right solution. That is, IT focuses on the data sources and figures out from there how to build the design of the data warehouse or the BI solution based on those sources. So rather than focusing on the user's needs and moving from right to left for the design, I've, you know, I've, I've seen this happen a lot in my consulting work over the years, and I'm often surprised how many times solutions get built that get little to no user input. So instead of moving from right to left, we miss exactly what the user is trying to do. And that's the whole point. We're trying to enable users to build their own reports. Now, sometimes users find that the data is too old for whatever decision that they need to make. In a BI solution, the data might be refreshed nightly or weekly. And some companies try to uh, achieve real-time BI to address this problem, but there can be a lot of technical challenges to that. And even if we have a real-time solution, there's likely other data that the users obtain from some other source that they want to analyze. And so in spite of plans to grow a data warehouse organically and introduce new data sources and manage new requirements periodically, you can probably never keep up with the analysis needs and the data requirements of the entire user community. And that's not to mention the other problems that we have as barriers to self-service, such as the structure of the data itself and the tools that users have available. So what happens is users do an end run around the BI solution. They start looking outside the sanctioned data sources because they need to get information to make decisions. And they'll get information from wherever they can. They'll find it internally, or maybe they'll get it from external business partners, and maybe they'll find some data on industry trends that they can download from an internet site. So they'll wind up manually compiling a lot of data. The bottom line is that the data they need for decision making on a day-to-day -day basis is not getting integrated into the corporate system. And as I already pointed out, in some cases, never will be, depending on what that information is. So they either get what they need from the corporate system and copy it into some other solution where they reformat it, or they ignore it entirely, choosing instead to build their own applications and spreadsheets and personal database applications.
So in this scenario, we find that the 80-20 rule applies, where 80% of the time is spent gathering and integrating data and reformatting it in some way, and only 20% of the time is actually spent performing analysis. So not only are these unmanaged solutions proliferating around the organization, but we run into problems with being able to repeat the process any time we get fresh data. And the solution is hard to share. It can be really difficult to send large workbooks through the email system where the files are 5 megabytes or 100 megabytes. And regardless of these difficulties, users find the, the value of the information is worth the pain, but now there's a whole uh, underground system that has no corporate oversight, and uh, that contributes to a lot of important decision making in the organization. And what we see in the Data Warehouse Institute is they had a comment about the self-service BI situation. They said, unfortunately, as many organizations have discovered the hard way, self-service BI is a myth and doesn't translate well to reality. Although the concept is valid, implementation is misguided, and the result is reporting chaos. And you know what? Not much has changed since then. This is from a few years back. I, but I think myth is too strong a word these days because there are a lot of organizations that have managed to empower users with BI, but those organizations are unfortunately the exception and not the rule. So with all that doom and gloom, does that mean that self-service BI will never be a reality? Well, my answer is no. I don't think so. And I think that the confluence of changes over the last decade position us for a positive outlook. Just think about the difference in the capabilities of a desktop computer today versus 10 years ago. And we have access to more data in more formats in greater volumes than ever before. We also have newer technologies to leverage that we can use to simplify the user experience. But the key is to be clear about the problem that you're trying to solve. And while I think self-service BI is poised to become a reality, I don't think it's a replacement for the BI systems that have been a focus in our past. Instead, I think we compromise and create complementary systems. There's a place for the structured data warehouse and a standard solution that IT maintains, and uh, we use that for quick consumption of historical data by a large community of users. But IT professionals should also prepare to support a new generation of self-service BI tools that can help avoid the problems that I've just described. So ideally, we need to develop a system that incorporates the self-service BI technology as part of the overall solution. We need to recognize that some data never will be part of the data warehouse, but we need a technology that makes it easy to integrate with the information that we spend a lot of time and money to build so that people can use that information with data that has short-term but immediate value. When looking at a self-service BI technology, we don't want another solution that's going to take a lot of time to roll out and just compound the problem that we already have. And we want a solution that can be up and running quickly, and one that makes it easy to change in the future as information needs change. We need to make sure that the technology is intuitive and allows users to work with data the way they're already used to thinking about it. In a way, the tool needs to facilitate the right-to-left approach that I recommend that IPT professionals take when designing a traditional BI solution. Now, thinking about collaboration, first, uh, with self-service BI, that's typically an independent activities. But when individuals discover some interesting information, they want to share it, and they need a centralized location to do that. So that by working together, new insights are possible, and that's what collaboration is all about. In fact, one study done by Aberdeen Group found that companies that excel at collaborative BI experienced a 42% improvement in employee productivity because the users weren't spending as much time searching for information. And they saw a 30% improvement in business process efficiency. Furthermore, these companies saw BI adoption increase by 40%. As more people see the benefits of the solution, they're more likely to use it. And two-thirds of the best-in-class companies were able to use their BI solution to make decisions within a day. Users need, to build, need the ability not only to post information to a central location, but they also need to be able to share and discuss the information and insights that are there. 
Maybe come up with an action plan and assign tasks. Maybe to turn around a negative trend or keep a positive trend moving in the right direction. And then when the information is centralized like this, there needs to be a way to refresh the data too, so that users don't have to start from scratch each time the data changes. And there should be a way to personalize the information so that others can leverage the work that were, that's initiated by the original author. Now just providing a centralized location for BI isn't enough for successful collaboration. It's important to define the rules of engagement for everyone that participates so that data is used efficiently and a culture of collaboration needs to be established and nurtured. One way that successful companies encourage collaboration is through the use of dashboards and portals that allow people not only to share the reports but also their insights. The collaborative solution should also have a way to trigger the delivery of information to the audience that would find it relevant. Now keep in mind that this is not just about implementing and enabling technology, but also about helping to change the way that people interact with information and each other, which is not going to happen overnight. Now a friend of mine named Donald Farmer, who's now a product advocate with ClickTech, he came up with a way to describe collaborative methods that's really stuck with me. And I've seen some of these methods work better than others, um, depending on the nature of the problem to solve, the personality types of the people involved in the collaborative effort, and the technology that's available. First, there's simultaneous collaboration, which you can think of as the type of collaboration that occurs when everyone's in the same place, either physically in the same meeting room or virtually through web conferencing. Everyone in the room or participating in the online conference call can typically view the same document. Collaboration can mean exploring a report together during a meeting, perhaps with one person displaying data with Microsoft Power View and responding to a request from the group to highlight and filter data during a discussion, and this can happen right within a PowerPoint presentation, connecting to live data and filtering on demand. And that helps everyone develop deeper insight into the nature of a situation. Maybe one person is designated to capture the suggestions that get made by the group and place that in a document, or remote participants can make edits concurrently in the same document. And it's very typical for the meetings discussions to require follow-up from various individuals, so a task list can be created during the meeting and tracked in a central location. Another method of collaboration is described as disjoint. Now, although information might be managed in a central location, people work with that information independently of one another. If changes need to be made, there might be a check-in and check-out process to prevent the proliferation of multiple copies that can get out of sync. And in this type of collaboration, there might also be a way to add comments that are visible to others who later work with the same information. And of course, others are free to make their own changes to the information and to add comments. And this technique works really well when coworkers are not in the same place at the same time. Individuals can sometimes be more thoughtful about the meaning behind the data if they have some time alone with it, rather than to be put on the spot during a meeting. And some users like the ability to explore the data more fully on their own. For example, they could take an existing Power Pivot workbook that's been published to SharePoint and then use that as a starting point for additional analysis, which they then save separately and perhaps combine with other information, either through a new dashboard at one end of the spectrum or just through a series of comments and links posted in a blog or wiki entry, entry at the other end of the spectrum. Then the third collaboration is a serialized approach. And in its simplest form, this can be the dissemination of information through email, moving from one person to another, where commentary accumulates in a single email thread and perhaps adjustments get made to an attached document, although ideally the email references content that's stored and updated in a central location so that people don't wind up working with the wrong version. Now, although many people rely heavily on email, it can sometimes be challenging to reconstruct a series of discussions and collaborative efforts through email alone. So another option might be to use a predefined automated workflow within SharePoint that not only stores the relevant content, but facilitates the commenting process and other types of collaborative features that are possible. And as I mentioned earlier, some methods work better than others, but that doesn't mean that any one of these methods is superior to others, and it really depends more on the culture of collaboration of the people involved. You might use a combination of methods to achieve your goals, but the bottom line is to eliminate barriers to collaboration rather than to enforce a specific approach. 
So let's now talk about what it means to work through the decision-making process using collaborative techniques. We call this the collaborative decision-making process. Now, most BI projects focus on getting information out to the business users but fail to close the loop. That is, they don't connect actions to business outcomes, and they don't capture lessons learned or best practices for future decisions. So a couple of years ago, Gartner published some research notes by Rita Salem, who I saw speak with Donald Farmer at an industry conference. And this idea of collaborative decision-making process that I heard them discuss really got the wheels turning for me about what was possible. So in a nutshell, collaborative decision-making allows employees to recognize a pro when a problem or opportunity exists that requires some type of decision. Now, this is typically not something that's expected for which we already have a business process in place, like a drop in inventory that requires replenishment. So then the next step is to do some investigation to diagnose the root cause of the problem. And that might require exploratory analysis, finding relevant information to provide more context for the problem at hand, and even finding expertise of others who have tackled this problem before or can help brainstorm and come up with alternative approaches. Ultimately, the group comes to a decision on the next steps to be taken and can assign responsibilities to one or more members of the group as needed. And importantly, once the outcome of these action items are known, the results should be recorded and discussed with the group, noting whether the expected outcome was achieved or not. And as a consequence, the lessons learned from the cycle of collaborative decision making can introduce new metrics that require ongoing monitoring, and the cycle begins anew. In short, collaborative decision making relies on business intelligence to highlight problems or opportunities. It uses collaboration and social networking to connect people, information, and their ideas. And it incorporates a workflow to facilitate a review process or a prescribed sequence of steps for decision making. Now, I should point out that this is the ideal process. And although many vendors might be trying to move their product offerings in a direction to better to support this process, to my knowledge, none of them have achieved this process completely. And I would like to emphasize that this is as much about process as it is about technology. If moving from your current decision-making process to a more collaborative decision-making process involves significant change, then you'll need to consider taking small incremental steps towards change. That said, much of what Gartner describes as necessary to the collaborative decision-making process is available today through features you can easily implement by using the built-in features of Microsoft SharePoint. So let's take a closer look at each of these steps and how they might be implemented in SharePoint. We might use a variety of mechanisms to monitor the current state of operations or trends, and a dashboard is a popular way to get this information, but we could just as easily use alerts, reports, or subscriptions, or other means to become aware of potential problems requiring some sort of action. In this case, we see that although we have one sales channel significantly higher than other channels over time, there's a significant drop off from one year to the next, and this downward trend is continuing. This is the sort of information from our business intelligence that requires a decision to intervene and either discover and resolve the problem causing the downward trend by channel or perhaps find a way to boost sales in other channels to compensate for the difference. Either way, we're making a decision to make a decision. Now, step two of the collaborative decision-making process is to diagnose the problem. One way that we can do this is to use our BI tools to, to perform ad hoc analysis and drill into the details and examine the data from a variety of perspectives. Performance point analytic charts and grids give us an easy way to do this from within the browser without even, without even opening up other tools. And we can filter, and we can drill, and we can ultimately get to the bottom three products to assess the drop in sales over time. Now, there are, of course, other tools supporting interactive data visualization and exploration, such as PowerView. And also, there's data mining that can surface patterns that we might not see through ad hoc analysis. Now, for disjoint collaboration, we can leave notes for others to invite a collaborative effort. Or we can participate in a team discussion that we and others can review later without having to go dig through emails to find out what people have committed to doing or what they've contributed to a discussion on a topic. We can also go looking for people. 
And we can do that by browsing an organizational chart that's available in SharePoint to find uh, peers or people who work for people who are in charge of things, or by using a keyword search. We can then review self-published information about areas of expertise to find people who are likely to be able to help us uncover the root cause of our problem. We can set up meetings, review documents together or individually, and continue this analysis process. The third step is to analyze and act. And during this period, we might develop one or more hypotheses about the problem. We can use tools like PowerPivot or even Excel to perform what-if analysis, combining actual data with estimates and assessing the results of increasing sales or reducing costs. We can even store the results of our brainstorming in this way as alternate versions of reports in a specially designated area of our site. And we can create assignments which we can view on the SharePoint site so we can keep track of where we are and who's responsible for which action item. But the most neglected step in this process is the assessment of results. If some action was taken, we need to keep reviewing the metrics for the problem area we identified, perhaps even by setting up new dashboards and reporting mechanisms. The bottom line is we need to see what happens as a result of our decision. And of course, the result that we're watching becomes the new input for another round of collaborative decision making should something go amiss while we're monitoring this area. But we're not done there. We actually need to document the process including both the expected and the actual outcomes. And one way to do this is to use wiki pages to describe the history and update it as we build up uh, different scenarios and test out our hypotheses and link to other documents. And eventually what we'll see happen is that successful decision patterns should emerge. If we have better information, better information not only about our business operations, but also about our decision-making processes, then we should inherently get better at the decision-making itself. So now that we have a general idea of how BI and collaboration can work together and how the collaborative decision-making process might work in a SharePoint environment, let's take a closer look at some of the necessary elements that make collaboration easier. SharePoint allows us to share business intelligence in a number of ways. The simplest way is to store reports in document libraries. Reports can be Excel or Power Pivot workbooks. They can be reporting services reports, whether that's standard reports or Power View reports. But putting this information into context is more easily done when we combine reports in whatever form into composite form as dashboards. Now to start, dashboards can be set up to present information about important metrics to monitor. Dashboards are really just a web part page. They let us combine multiple pieces of information. And we can combine uh, performance point content with reporting services reports. We can include Excel documents in there. And we can even include unstructured documents. But with the, the structured data, that is the data that's coming from some sort of relational source or analysis services cubes, we can link that together. We can add filters to our dashboard and, and make one change to a filter and, and see that ripple effect across multiple web parts in the same dashboard. So that would be my primary vision of a dashboard is a very visual environment. But um, when we do this, what we want to do is not just take our reports and put them into, into web part pages, but we want to think about the design of those reports so that we are emphasizing the visual aspect of this, that we're fitting everything onto a single screen. We're not requiring the users to scroll to, to see related bits of information. And um, we want to uh, emphasize trends and outliers. and link to other information. The goal with a dashboard, initially anyway, is not to tell the entire story, but just to emphasize that something requires further investigation and that action might need to be taken. Now remember that the part of the process of collaborative decision making is the gathering of information. So once you've started that collaborative um, decision-making process, you might think about setting up a sub-site for collecting and organizing your information that's related to that particular decision-making process. And a dashboard can be a very useful way of bringing together items of related information. 
Now, even though I, I see the primary purpose of a dashboard is to be highly visual, once we're into a decision-making process, I can see it being repurposed um, away from just a, a simple visual overview of our business processes, but it can also help us with our targeted purposes, such as the information gathering phase of our decision-making process. That is, we can add additional web parts to bring together uh, pieces of other reports that highlight our problem, to consolidate various bits of re related information. We can show lists of shared documents. Uh, we can show the sh current status of discussions and tasks. So basically, we have one-stop shopping for all of the information that's relevant to our decision-making process. Another uh, aspect of collaborative BI is how to find people who can help you. And an easy way to do this within SharePoint is to enable user profiles. You can synchronize user profiles with your network's Active Directory and uh, with other business systems that provide suppl supplemental information about each user. And although there are many benefits associated with implementing user profiles, for collaboration purposes specifically, we use user profiles to understand where others fit within this hierarchical structure of the organization. And in a large organization, or even for new employees in smaller organizations, having a, a view of how people are related to one another within the organization can be quite helpful. We can also use user profiles to create social networks where we can identify people who share common organizational or work group goals or defined interests. And within the social network, we can stay on top of what's happening through what others are sharing in a less formal way. And we can jump into a conversation that we can contribute to or we can be made aware of information that we might not have access to otherwise if we were solely depending upon email or monitoring network shares or using web folders to uh, check for new files. Also, user profiles can capture information about coworkers that can be relevant when we're using the people search in SharePoint to find people who might be able to help on a given topic. This information is more likely to be contributed by individuals themselves as they update their own profiles rather than come from business systems. But regardless, we have a, a centralized location for gathering up information about uh, the individuals across the organization. Now, a key piece of social network uh, management is the implementation of my site websites, which makes user profiles incredibly useful. And one of the transitions we see in the development of content on the web, something called Web 2.0, is also an important transition for organizational content. And what I mean by that is that the value of my site websites increases when more people are publishing more information. Now, information that's as relatively minor in the grand scheme as a status update can start a conversation that winds up leading to new or improved relationships or point you to uh, information or uh, alert you to uh, new projects that got started. Uh, but that just helps you get to know your coworkers better or know what's going on around you. Think of it the, as the electronic version of the water cooler. And then there's content that a user creates, and you can see it as a collection of items as long as you have the right permissions. Now, this is another way of finding content that might be helpful to the decision-making process. So as you're exploring people in the organization that have the expertise you think you need, you can explore their profiles and, and see the content that they've developed and see what the kinds of things that they're sharing. And uh, in another sort of way, the entry of blog posts can also identify someone as a subject matter expert that you might find through the search mechanism. A user can tag a post, and the resulting tag cloud can surface the type of content in which that user specializes or uh, the type of content that they're engaging with the most. And of course, blog posts are a great way to document lessons learned about the collaborative decision-making process in general, as well as specific decisions uh, that the user has participated in. This type of feedback on what worked and what didn't for earlier decision-making exercises can be incredibly useful, but it does take a recognition of that usefulness and a willingness to take the time to document the processes that make that happen. Now, another aspect of the MySite websites is this uh, consolidation of information through a news feed. 
For example, you can't monitor activity by these tags. Basically, you identify your interests and your news feeds uh, includes those items and either for those items or for people that you're following. And in fact, for people that you're following, you can also see their status updates or you can see notes that they've posted. So this is your ongoing uh, collection point for things that are going on for anything that you might be interested in. And you're able to configure through the news feed settings what exactly you want to monitor. So uh, if things are a little too noisy, you can uh, um, make changes and, and just monitor uh, just updates or tags or monitor notes or you can track specific uh, tags that you want to monitor, but you have control over how much or ho how little you want to capture through your news feed. So this is your view into all of those things that interest you. Okay, part of the process of collaborative decision making is the gathering of information. And one of the things that you can do is to set up a subsite for collecting and organizing information related to a particular decision. And that includes information about discussions that you're having. Discussions can take form uh, in many different ways. An important aspect of the collaboration process is commenting. So maybe you're using scorecards to track uh, performance. You can actually add comments to scorecards as one way of um, continuing a discussion. But those comments are limited to specific cells of a scorecard and require you to open up each cell's comments individually to see what's going on. Another option is to use the note board on the dashboard or web page or even on individual documents to collect comments. There's also a note board feature on your My Site websites to, uh, for people to leave notes for you directly. But basically, you can think of uh, note board as an ongoing series of comments that you can attach to any type of object in SharePoint. Again, dashboards or web pages or uh, as you're browsing individual documents. And you can open up these notes and, uh, and see this ongoing series of comments. And other ways that you can collaborate include commenting on blog posts or modifying wiki pages. So you can think of a blog as a, within the work context as a subject-oriented threaded conversation that begins with a main idea posted by one author and then a series of comments posted by other people that follow on. Whereas with a wiki page, the original idea can be enhanced and modified over time by multiple people. And so it's all part of one living document. But version control allows you to preserve each state from the original to the current version so that you can see how uh, that conversation had progressed over time. And another aspect of sharing that's important for a collaborative environment is taking steps to make sure that other people can more easily find information that you post or uh, that you want to find yourself or the things that you found. So tags are uh, keywords that are user generated. So it's not part of a formal taxonomy. Anyone can add a tag just by clicking the tag link and just by typing. And uh, as you start typing, there might be some suggestions of words that people have already started to use as a tag. So you can uh, at least create some consistency across multiple users when you can see that somebody else has something that uh, is close to what you were looking for. Now, uh, only users with managed social data permission can actually delete a tag. Now, the My Site website includes a tag cloud web part, and then you can use that to filter and find information. And also, if, if you include a tag in your profile, you can get notified when a uh, web page gets tagged with that information. So that would come through your news feed. Another way to enhance discoverability is to use ratings to help people assess information in a SharePoint list, a document library, or even individual web pages. And so the idea is that when you have a lot of content available, users can provide feedback not only to other users about content that they find helpful and have that bubble up to the surface, but this is also something that users can use as a feedback mechanism for report developers and help weed out reports that are deemed less helpful so that we aren't um, faced with this deluge of uh, reports trying to find which report has the information that we're looking for. Speaking of information, there's this interesting theory that's been developed to explain how people look for information. And it's called information foraging. 
And I first heard this uh, about this from Donald Farmer, who's just a fount of information for me. It, yet another talk he did that inspired me to think about other ways to design collaborative environments, specifically with um, searching for information as uh, an important element of this. So this information foraging theory has its roots in the food foraging theories that have been developed by ecologists and anthropologists. And it's based on the idea that maximum energy gets expended by a predator when, um, when prey is most likely to be found, or in the places where prey is most likely to be found, and in particular where the prey worth pursuing is likely to be found. So two guys from Palo Alto Research Center, uh, Peter Paroli and Stuart Card, are the guys that took that food foraging theory, and in the early 90s, they adapted it to the hunt for information. That is, they decided that the search patterns were very similar to food foraging. And so since then, there's been a lot of work to model searching and, of, a, and of course, to apply this to computing. The most important concept in the information foraging theory is information scent. So as animals rely on scent to indicate the chances of finding prey in the current uh, area and guide them to other promising patches, humans also rely on various cues in the information environment to get similar answers. In fact, human users will estimate how much useful information they're likely to get on a given path. And after seeking information, they compare the actual outcome with what they were predicting. When the information sense stops getting stronger, in other words, when they no longer expect to find useful additional information, then they move on to a different information source. Now, some tendencies in the behavior of web users are more easily understood from the information a foraging theory standpoint where we have the web where each site is a patch and information is the prey, and leaving a site is easy, but finding good sites has not always been easy. And advanced search engines have changed this fact by, by providing relevant links and altering the foraging strategies of our users. So when users expect that they're going to uh, have sites with lots of information and those are easy to find, then they don't have the same incentive to stay in one place, and we call that information snacking. So the growing availability of broadband connections where we're just always um, always on, basically, whether we have our smartphones or tablets or whatever, where uh, we're quickly looking for information, that this probably has a similar effect. We, we're encouraging these short online visits to get specific answers. And so how does this relate to our collaborative environment? Well, if we understand how people are looking for information and their natural uh, patterns of behavior, we need to think about how we're storing information and how we add metadata and tags and ratings and so on to provide the right information sent and to uh, make these information snacking expeditions as fruitful as possible. So. Assuming that, over time, information has been accumulating in our collaborative environment, what are the main ways that people are going to go about finding that information? Well, one option is to browse. And the simplest way to set up content to support browsing is to take a subject-oriented approach. This allows people to um, assess the available content. But you know, having a list of links is not always helpful. You really have to click through each link to find out what a report is. And that's why PowerPivot workbooks and PowerView reports provide a visual display in the document library known as the PowerPivot Gallery. If you can produce reports in PowerPivot or PowerView, these reports really lend themselves well to the browsing approach to finding information. Another way to find information is to do a search. But the user has to know the right words to use in a search. And the authors of reports need to enhance reports with the right keywords to make sure that they can be found. And in a collaborative environment, social discovery provides yet another way to find information. Social discovery relies on recommendations among peers. Simply put, you just ask someone who knows and get their suggestions. Now, you can do this face-to-face, -face, or you can post a request to status updates or mention something on a note board. Or as you're browsing through user profiles, you can explore their content page, which is an implicit type of suggestion. And of course, news feeds are another way to service content, but you have to be paying attention. A news feed can highlight popular content. 
And so it's a great way to look for things that might be of interest to you. But you can always configure the types of activities that you want to see here. So if there's a lot of activity appearing in your news feed, it can be easy to lose sight of important information signaling a change that you're trying to monitor. And so if you uh, change the noise factor, if you reduce the types of things that you're monitoring there, it might be easier to see the things that you're really, really interested in. So all of these methods are supported easily in SharePoint. And as one librarian put it, we can have it all with search. We can have search for seekers who know what they want, social for seekers who want to listen and engage, and browsing for seekers who want to meander and just let the collection speak for itself. So. How do you get started? Obviously, the processes and collaboration tools I discussed in today's presentation have a dependency on SharePoint. And if you don't currently have a SharePoint implement implementation, then consider these features to be a benchmark against which you can measure uh, for a vendor that you're considering and see if they're delivering these capabilities and prioritize the ones that you think can provide the most value to your users. Where I mentioned SharePoint in the subsequent step, think. Uh, subsequent steps that I'm going to list here, think creatively how you can use the tools that you have in similar ways. And if you do have a SharePoint implementation, you might feel a bit overwhelmed by all the possibilities if you're not already using these features. So take a step back and think about taking an incremental approach and prioritize the features that deliver the most value. Now, because collaboration is as much about people and process as it is about technology, be sure to allocate time to teach users how to incorporate collaboration tools into their decision-making skills. Start with a small, motivated group and work through the process a few times on small projects, and then use that team to mentor others through the process. When other people see how effective the small group is, they're going to want some of that for themselves. And an important way to support the collaboration process is to start getting knowledge collected in the SharePoint environment. One useful technique is to encourage people to use blog posts or other online tracking mechanisms as a way to answer questions that they receive in email. They can answer the question in depth and then send the response not only to the person asking the question, but also directly to a SharePoint blog. Now, obviously, that's not applicable to every email, but where questions relate to corporate or department processes and have value to a broader audience now or to future employees or decision-making processes, it makes sense to start building up that body of knowledge. And SharePoint makes it really easy to add blog posts by sending an email or from a Word document, so the barrier to getting this task done is really low. Also bear in mind that people are not going to embrace collaborative decision making if they feel like the technology is not helping them get the job done. If they feel like it's impeding them, they're simply not going to use it. So we need to adapt our processes to how users want to work. And SharePoint allows us to use the things that are helpful and, and ignore the things that aren't. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Collaborative BI, I've set up a page on my website where I've included some links to some of the resources that I found helpful in learning about Collaborative BI and the collaborative features in SharePoint 2010 in particular. And I'll be updating this page from time to time, beginning with links to a blog series in which I'll walk through in more detail many of the items that I've discussed in today's presentation. That way, it'll help you visualize the benefits and the usage and how to implement it more clearly. So that's it for our time today. Thanks so much for joining me. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. All right. Well, thanks so much, Stacia. Um, great presentation. And um, this is a good time to uh, take some questions in the Q&A tab that you should see to the right of uh, the slide area. Uh, Stacia, one, one question that has come up, um, people were wondering about access to the slides. Is there going to be a method that people can access those? Yes, I, I don't have it on that, uh, that, that link. Let me, um, let me pull that back up again just so that, uh, that we can see that link. Sorry about that. Um, but I, I don't have it there right this moment, but I will uh, very shortly have uh, access to uh, the copy of the slides so that you can download those in PDF format. Great. We can include that in a follow-up email we'll do when the recording is available as well. Great. Let's see here. So any other questions coming in? Um, we have one thank you from Abhishek. You're welcome. 
And let's see here. <clears throat> uh, great stuff. So no, no questions yet. Um, a couple of people just th saying thank you, and uh, I would definitely second that. Um, you know, Stacia, I hear you sort of using SharePoint as sort of a, a reference of of how things can be measured. I think that's a, a great point. Um, is that is that primarily because it, it, I think it's particularly um, applicable to to this audience being uh, focused on Microsoft Dynamics products and, and in the Microsoft ecosystem to some extent already? Do you find that SharePoint does tend to become um, you know the, the starting point for a lot of uh, a lot of companies looking to to start adding collaborative elements to their BI? Well, if people are 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 already using Microsoft uh, products, it it is a great way to get started. I mean, it's just one of those things that um, I think can be all things to all people. You know, if it's very easy to be overwhelmed by everything that SharePoint can do, and um, and so my advice is, you know, just focus on little things at a time, mm -hmm. and don't don't try to do all of it at once because that can be overwhelming. But the 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 idea behind Microsoft SharePoint is that IT sets up the servers, sets up the environment, and lets the business users run with it. And the extent to which business users actually do really depends uh, on the organization. So some places might need a lot of IT involvement to, to get the sites built and, and facilitate that collaboration. And in other places, you, you would have you know, key power users who can basically take charge of that and set up the, the sites and the dashboards and, and set up these things on the fly. So it's, it's, uh, it really is a combination of factors that determine the extent to which SharePoint gets used and how it gets used and you know which factors get used. So it's uh it's it's across the board, it really is. All right. Um one question that just came in, um how do you see Yammer fitting into this discussion? I'm sorry, how do I see the acquisition of Yammer? I'm oh, interested. that's oh right, right, right. I, I my ears are a little plugged today. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, that's an interesting thing. So you know, I I didn't mention other tools um, that could be part of this. Microsoft had Office Communicator before, but um, but Office Communicator is kind of like instant messaging, where you know you have a a, a live conversation, and where Yammer can sort of be that live thing, but it also um, preserves the history so that uh, the, think about that disjoint collaboration not everybody's going to be in the same t t uh, place at the same time even if they're virtually at the same place you know on Yammer people are going to uh, be away uh, for various reasons and so Yammer provides that opportunity to, to catch up and so it's yet another tool for the toolbox that uh, that we can incorporate there and I, I wouldn't be surprised I, I don't have any knowledge of this so you know don't take this for <laughs> Any kind of special insight, but I wouldn't be surprised to see integration with uh, between SharePoint and Yammer in the future. It, it just makes sense and fits into the collaborative strategy that I see uh, Microsoft unfolding here. All right, uh, maybe I'll make a last call here for questions, and uh, if we don't have anything else, um, I think uh, maybe we will wrap up. Let's see one more thing coming in. Um, yeah, just uh, appreciate all the comments that have come in, and uh, we will wrap it up here. We will um, be sharing a recording of this, and if you hang on the line, we do have one other uh, special announcement for anyone who wants to wait around, but I will say thank you, uh, Stacia, for your time today, and, uh, and thanks to everyone for attending.